um, and again, it's, it's very expensive. So it's got, depending upon which category we're talking about, has a fairly high mortality rate. All right, so obviously what happens is we get some type of pathogen um, that is able to get down into the lower respiratory tract. Um, how this can happen is number one, through aspiration or micro aspiration. Aspiration is where, um, is where you get contents from the stomach or the um, upper respiratory or the upper GI tract, I guess, the oral pharynx, and you inhale it into the lungs. Um, aspiration pneumonia is where you have a large uh, quantity of that that comes up, but you can also have micro aspiration where it's just small amounts. And we all probably do that in the middle of the night, but um, most of us don't get sick from it. Another thing you can do is you can inhale that, um, that uh, pathogen. And every now and then you, it can spread via the blood, or if you happen to have something going on outside of the lung parenchyma, but it can uh, come in from the pleural space or mediastinal space. Um, as we talked, uh, talked about yesterday, um, we have protective barriers, um, all of us do, that, that helps us not get sick from these sorts of things. Um, you know, we've got hairs in our nose and turbinates that help trap uh, these, these pathogens or particles. Just the natural branching of the, of the bronchial system architecture helps to trap these microbes. The mucociliary clearance just works the bacteria up. Um, we have a gag reflex um, and then a, a follow-up cough to help um, um, to help, you know, bring bring that sort of stuff up. I'm sorry, I'm gonna put that on. He's leaving right now. So, um, and then we have macrophages deep down that can kill that bacteria. So there's usually um, a reason that occurs as to why we get the infection. <coughs> Um, so when the capacity of those macrophages to, to kill off that bacteria, or not only bacteria, but the pathogen, um, that's when clinical pneumonia occurs. And um, most of the symptoms that we see with pneumonia is not actually due to the bacteria, but our immune system's reaction to it. So by our getting a cascade of, of inflammatory cells and such, we see fever, we see the increased white blood cell count, we see increased secretions, um, we see sometimes even a capillary leakage, including red blood cells. That's why sometimes you, when a person coughs up sputum, it can be bloody or blood tinged or hemoptysis, which is gross blood. Um, because it's so full with mucus and fluid and inflammatory stuff, we become hypoxic. Um, and then just, again, that decreased lung, lung compliance. We aren't able to um, oxygenate as well. Okay, so risk factors for pneumonia. Obviously, if you've had a recent upper respiratory infection, <coughs> it can work its way down, down south. Um, age can play a big role, the, the very young and the very old. Smoking and alcohol, excessive alcohol intake, alcoholics. <coughs> if you have other lung diseases, oh, you wanted to make a... It's okay. I'm so sorry. sorry. Also not making it out. No, go ahead. Yes. You can just give it right now. <laughs> sorry, if you want to. Um, I need to probably talk to Kate, but we were just told that the email that I sent out to you guys, that we actually don't have to pay for our graduation ceremony. The money that we're raising is just going to be specifically for our class and whatever we want to do with it. Okay. So, is that there's no stress of paying for graduation now? So, it's all paid for through the pain of this. That's it. That's it. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot that. Oh, you're fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> all right, so not only other lung disorders, but other um, medical conditions such as diabetes, heart failure, pulmonary edema. Uh, sets you up for greater risk of pneumonia. <coughs> <laughs> 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 yes. 
gas, if you've had history of toxic um, inhalation, if you worked in a occupation where you had to breathe in bad chemicals. Um, if you, for some reason, have had have a decreased cough reflex, such as a stroke or um, who knows what, <laughs> anything like that, uh, where you have a lower mental capacity. If you are immunosuppressed or severely malnourished, um, and if you are hospitalized, you are at greater risk, especially if you are uh, intubated. All right, so symptoms. The, the three big things are fever, cough with or without sputum, and shortness of breath. And then there are a number of other constitutional symptoms that, that a person can have. Uh, sweats, chills, some pleurisy, chest discomfort, uh, coughing up blood, fatigue, just feeling kind of achy in your muscles, having a poor appetite, headache, and, and diffuse abdominal discomfort. Fever. Again, uh, some other things you can get is uh, diaphoresis can get kind of clammy, sweaty, increased uh, breathing rate, increased heart rate, usually if you have a high fever, um, and again, the coughing up blood. On exam, you're going to notice dullness to percussion. We were just talking about that. Like, what the heck am I listening for when I percuss? And we as clinicians probably don't percuss as much as we probably should. But again, when you are, the, the sound when you percuss should be about the same all over. If you have an area of consolidation or pneumonia, that's going to sound a lot more dull over that more dense dense area versus an area that's more air filled. The opposite is true. If you have a person with emphysema um, and they have these this big barrel chest that's full of trapped air, they're going to sound even more resonant or tympanic. I'm not quite sure the uh, correct terminology, but it's going to sound different than a regular one when you percuss it. Um, we also talked about the increased frematis, that, that uh, tactile frematis, that vibration when you feel the uh, person say 99. Um, you're going to notice uh, an increased frematis, that vibration over that consolidation. Ronchi rails or crackles um, are some uh, lung sounds, and I don't think we quite <coughs> explained that enough yesterday, so I'm going to go over that a little bit today, what those lung sounds are. Egophony, again, where when you're listening, um, when you have the patient say E, it's going to sound more like an A um, over an area of consolidation versus normal lung tissue. And then maybe some abdominal tenderness. Okay, so again, adventitious. Have you heard of that term? I don't think we said that yesterday. Adventitious are abnormal lung sounds. Okay, so sometimes in your note, you're, you might say when you're writing it up, heard no adventitious sounds bilaterally. Adventitious is abnormal. Okay, these are some abnormal sounds that you're going to be listening for. Crackles or rails. These are synonymous terms. You're going to hear both. I tend to use crackles, um, but you, you can hear rails as well. Um, this tends to be a very brief intermittent sound. It's not continuous through inspiration or expiration. You do tend to hear this in inspiration rather than expiration. This tends to be a, a crackling or clicking or rattling type of sound. And then you have fine crackles and coarse crackles, all right? Your fine crackles tend to be a, a little bit softer and higher pitched, and your coarse crackles tend to be a little bit louder but lower in pitch. And the, this occurs when you have air that's opening up these little small airways that are filled up with, they're kind of sticking together, um, and they have fluid or mucus or pus in there. So when you breathe in, it just kind of pops those open. Um, you're going to see this when you have abnormalities in the lung parenchyma. The parenchyma is, is further down the chain where that oxygen 
um, exchange is happening, uh, such as in pneumonia, interstitial lung disease. You're going to, we're going to talk about interstitial lung disease. That's some diseases that that um, result in scarring tissue uh, in within the lungs. Um, pul pulmonary fibrosis, same sort of thing. Atelectasis, where the, the lung kind of collapses on itself or part of the lung collapses. And heart failure. Or if you have abnormalities in the, the bronchioles, or excuse me, the, um, the airways, the bronchioles, um, such as with bronchitis or bronchiectasis. Okay, then we have wheezes and bronchi. Um, these tend to be more of a continuous sound that we hear, then this can be during inspiration or expiration. Asthma tends to be during expiration more so. We're going to learn that. And again, we have our wheezes, what we call wheezes, are also sometimes called sibilant wheezes. These tend to be higher pitched and kind of musical, like a hiss or a whistle or a squeak, um, and again, tend to occur in smaller bronchi, further down on the chain, um, such as asthma. <coughs> bronchi, or also called a sonorous wheeze, tends to be a little bit louder, lower, and it sounds more like a, a snore, okay? These occur in larger bronchi, such as tracheobronchitis, um, and this is where you have uh, secretions. It's thought to be more secretions, and these oftentimes will clear with the cough. So if you hear something kind of that deep, almost snore-like rattle or whatever, you might say, hey, can you try and cough and clear that out of there? And oftentimes it will, okay? Crackles don't clear with the cough, okay? So these two, any of your wheezes or your ronchi, um, are due to narrow passageways, air moving through narrow passageways. All right, so let's talk about pneumonia itself. Does that help a little bit with those adventitious sounds? Mm -hmm. I don't care, well, I hate to say that. To me, I wouldn't test so much over the, the normal lung sounds. I would be more interested in you knowing these abnormal lung sounds, when you're going to hear them, kind of what they represent. Okay. All right, so we have pneumonia classification. We have community acquired, and then a subset of community acquired is our healthcare associated pneumonias. Community acquired are, are those infections, pneumonias that occur when a person is not hospitalized, okay? Or if, it ha if they start having symptoms less than 48 hours after they've been admitted, okay? So they're not admitted for pneumonia, they're admitted for something else, uh, but within, you know, in the first two days of them being hospitalized, they develop pneumonia. That being, they were probably exposed to whatever pathogen before they became hospitalized, um, and they're just showing the symptoms now. Healthcare-associated pneumonia are, are people who are not hospitalized in a hospital, but are around other healthcare things, such as they, they live in a nursing home, they've been recently hospitalized within the last 90 days, they go to a dialysis unit, they have um, infusion, IV infusion care or wound care, even if a, a healthcare provider is coming to them, where they may expose them to, to different bacteria. Um, immunocompromised state. And then you have nosocomial. Nosocomial is a term for hospital acquired. It happened in the hospital. Uh, and you have just regular hospital acquired pneumonia, and then you have your ventilator associated pneumonia. Hospital acquired obviously occurs after 48 hours of admission. So they've been, they've been exposed to whatever pathogen during hospitalization, and then it starts to pre present, present itself. Then the later uh, associated is after they've been intubated, um, you know, within the first two to three days after intubation. All right, 
right, we also, when we're talking about bacterial pneumonia, we also kind of categorize between typical bacteria and atypical bacteria. Atypical bacteria um, are a little bit, I guess, more challenging in the fact that you're not going to be able to culture them. You don't see them on, on gram stains like you do your, your typical bacteria. Um, and they can't be cultured as readily. Um, and so you have to use a little bit different antibiotic for it. Okay, it, it's not going to be your beta lactams, your you know, penicillins and things like that are not going to cover them, so you have to use more of an erythromycin family of, of drug. Or quinolone, macrolide is the erythromycin <coughs> family. You know, a good percentage of the time you're going to have polymicrobes, uh, more than one pathogen. All right, so what are the typical um, pathogens in the community acquired? Uh, for adults, strep pneumo or pneumococcal pneumonia, those terms are synonymous. That's number one, pretty much across the board. Um, and then H flu, staph, group A strep, Moraxella. Strep pneumo is going to be your number one, though of your atypical bacteria, so that's, those are your typical bacteria, your atypical bacteria, you've got your mycoplasma, legionella, and chlamydia species. And then you've got viruses um, in the adult population, your influenza A and B is the most likely cause to, for, of the virus family. Uh, that, number one is strep pneumo. All right, and then you have a little bit of a variation, not much, um, if, if depending upon how sick these people are, patients that are just being treated amb in an ambulatory setting, strep pneumo um, is number one, and they have to be hospitalized, but they're not going to the ICU, strep pneumo, uh, pretty much the very same top two anyway. Um, if you get into a person that is so severe that you need to directly admit them to the ICU, then your number two more likely is, is Staph aureus. Um, and you may see more Legionella, uh, which is a, an atypical, you may get more into your atypicals. And gram negatives. Okay, for children, Again, it kind of depends upon the age of them. For the newborns and the very young, the, the biggest cause of infection for them is what they're kind of exposed to through the birth canal or, or through the mother. So um, streptococcus, um, rubistrep, E. coli um, are the two main ones. Don't worry about the listeria. Um, Beyond that very first, you know, infant age group, you have a much more likelihood of their pneumonias to be caused by viruses rather than bacteria. Of the viruses, um, most of it is RSV and your parainfluenzas. As so, that's about the first five years of life. After five years of life, then you start seeing. Um, more bacterial etiologies and less viral. Make sense? This pretty much says the same thing. Um, the RSV and um, the parrot influenza, don't worry about that meta pneumovirus. And then older than five years of age, you start seeing the common etiologies are more, more bacterial and less so your, um, I mean, you still see them, but, but not as much, the viruses. And then you're always, you know, when you are suspect pneumonia, you always have to kind of think about, okay, what's the popular, what type of patient do I have? Um, and are they in any higher risk group areas? Are they a diabetic? Are they 
uh, an alcoholic? Are they, um, do they have they had a stroke and at a lot greater risk of, of aspiration? Things like that will help you to better determine what your starting antibiotic is going to be, or your empiric antibiotic treatment. Okay, does that make sense? And again, if, you know, lower down there, if, if they've um, had gone traveling to the river valleys or southern United States or something like that, where they could have some of these odder, more odd uh, fungal Okay, community choir clinical manifestations can be a huge range of how they present from very mild to very ill um, and could be fatal. It could be febrile um, with heart, rapid heart rate. Um, I'm not going to go over a lot of these. Coffee, they're productive or non productive. Could be blood tinged. They could speak in full sentences or they could be incredibly short of breath and not be able to speak in complete sentences. Sometimes you can have um, some inflammation of that pleura and they're having increased chest pain or sometimes if it's really bad, they can get a pleural effusion in there, a collection of fluid. Um, so. And that's basically what we talked about. Um, Okay, so if you've got a person, a patient, and you're like, okay, number one, is this pneumonia? Could this be pneumonia? And if so, what's the most likely pathogen that's causing this pneumonia? So, is this pneumonia? You go to your clinical, what you see on exam, what you hear from history, and what you see on x-ray. The latter, you're going to try to figure out what what bug it might be. Obviously we have other things that can present like this, um, chronic bronchitis or an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, <coughs> acute bronchitis, a pulmonary embolism, things like that. Um, most of the time if a person is pretty doggone healthy and are previously healthy and they're not that ill in appearance you may not even need a chest x-ray um, you might just treat them empirically uh, but it can sometimes be helpful to differentiate just a, a, a bronchitis versus a, a pneumonia where you may want to treat with an antibiotic versus not And another thing to know is that some of these other labs, the if you're going to get a sputum, that can take several days to get the results. So typically you want to start, if you are highly suspicious that they have pneumonia, you see a consolidation, you're going to treat them. You're not going to sit around and wait for that sputum culture results to come back. You're going to get them on a good empiric treatment, and then once you get the results, if it helps you at all, then you can change accordingly. Okay, so as I said before, um, sometimes getting a sputum and uh, gram stain and culture isn't really necessary if they're not that sick. You're just going to treat them with empiric antibiotic therapy, and most of the time that will take care of things. You do want to, to try to get specific etiology of what bug is causing this. Um, if they've, you know, had some unusual travel history um, or if they're hospitalized for sure. All right, so what other labs might we get? Gram stain and, and culture of the sputum. This entails the patient coughing up some of their sputum and you collecting it and sending it to, to the lab. The, the thing about that though is to get a good, you can't just clear your throat and, and use that as your sputum sample. It has to come from deep, <laughs> deep down. 
Um, and so the, the gram stain is really a way to see that you got an adequate specimen. And the definition of that is that it has to have more than 25 white blood cells and less than 10 epithelial cells. So if you're just clearing your throat high up here, you're going to have a lot more epithelial cells and just a few bacteria. And that's not really a good, good quality specimen. This can be real difficult to get that big, deep cough to bring up specimen for especially your elderly patients, children, things like that. Anytime, if you plan to get this type of testing done, make sure you do obtain it before you start on the antibiotics. If they've been on antibiotics for even a couple of days, it's going to completely skew those results and they'll mean nothing. Blood cultures, uh, sometimes you'll get blood cultures, probably, again, not in just the routine outpatient, but if a person is more sick, hospitalized, anything like that, and this is just, you want to see if that bacteria infection has spread into the bloodstream. Usually you get two sets of blood cultures. Um, but again, oftentimes the, the the yield of positive results that you get with blood cultures are typically low, and of what you do get, it's most of the time um, pneumococcal, strep pneumo. So more than likely, you will have already started them on an antibiotic that covers for that anyway. So don't know if that you know would give you that much information, but I think you do need to at least try to obtain that if if people are pretty sick for sure, hospitalized. You want to get a CBC looking for the uh, leukocyte uh, increased white blood cell count. CMP, um, consider ABGs if uh, their O2 sat on pulse ox is low. Um, and then they have a urine test that, that looks for the both pneumococcal and Legionella, the antigens of those. So um, that's something that you can consider for both. If, I would do regardless. And what's nice about that is you can get that even after you've you've obtained or started the person on antibiotics. So don't wait, postpone antibiotics for this or initiating antibiotics for this. All right, here they have a couple of um, inflammatory markers uh, that they are starting to use for um, pneumonias. One is C-reactive protein, and the other one is the procalcitonin. Um, the C-reactive protein is more specifically for pneumococcal, okay? Um, so again, I don't know if I would, because you know pneumococcal is the most common cause kind of across the board, I don't know if I would put the expense into to doing that if I'm covering for that anyway. Does that make sense? Um, the uh, procalcitonin has been used primarily in the emergency room to distinguish a bacterial cause from a non-bacterial cause. And it actually has better uh, sensitivity and specificity than the C-reactive protein. The C-reactive protein is um, is very unspecific. It's kind of like the sed rate. Have you heard about the sed rate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, 18 gazillion things could cause that to be elevated. So it's, it's not that helpful unless if it's really, really high or something like that. So I, again, I could see performing that PCT uh, more so, again, just to better determine does this need a, a, a bacteria or does it not need a bacteria? If a person is pretty darn ill and no matter what, you're going to cover them with antibiotic, then I don't know if I'd put the cost into that. I think you have to think about a lot of these tests as to, one, is it going to help me make a specific diagnosis? And number two, is it going to help change how I treat this patient in the long run anyway? If it's really not, then don't put the expense into it. 
All right, so chest x-ray. Obviously, we want a chest x-ray. This is going to help confirm our diagnosis and kind of see how a person's responding. If you, if you see a consolidation several weeks to a couple months down the later, you may decide to do a repeat chest x-ray just to make sure that it looks like it's resolving. If it's not, then you may need to, to go down a different path. Maybe you've, maybe you've got the wrong diagnosis. Um, so chest x-ray is important. You're always going to order a PA, posterior to anterior, and a lateral view. <clears throat> I remember when I first started, I didn't realize that PA was actually how they, you know, they took the, the, the shot from posterior to anterior, um, and I was right AP, and <laughs> so I was just doing it wrong. I didn't, I didn't understand what that meant. Um, all right, so if we see a new infiltrate along with our clinical signs of cough, fever, shortness of breath, that's diagnostic. Now, one thing to remember is sometimes chest x-ray signs, the, the consolidation can kind of lag behind the signs and symptoms that the patient is presenting with um, by a few days. So. Uh, or especially if a person is dehydrated. So sometimes if you are really feeling like this is pneumonia, but you're not really seeing it on the film too much, then you might go ahead and repeat it in a couple of days and see if that changes. Imaging on the chest x-ray. And again, next week we've got a real good guy coming in to talk much more about the normal x-ray and abnormal x-ray. And I'm sorry we couldn't get them in beforehand. It just was a scheduling um, problem, but um, at least we'll, we will get to it. Um, but sometimes the pattern of what you see on the x-ray can help you determine what bug or what the etiology pathogen it might be. You've got your low bar pneumonia or a focal, and that tends to be your strep pneumo, H flu, and legionella. Bronchopneumonia is where you have kind of multifocal areas within that, within that lobe. Okay, it's not quite as wided out, it's a little bit more patchy. Staph and those others can cause that. Interstitial pneumonia, or pattern, um, is where you get this fine, real fine, diffuse infiltrates. And with that, you're going to see more with your influenza uh, pneumonias and the other two. Lung abscesses is what you're going to see more with anaerobes, right? That's where they uh, kind of break down <laughs> lung tissue and just get this walled off uh, abscess with an air fluid level in there. And then nodular lesions, either multiple or single, they're going to be bigger, um, look a little bit more white because sometimes there can be some calcification in them. And this is going to, you're going to see this more in tuberculosis you'll talk about, but also pneumonia-wise, uh, your fungal things, the histo, coccidio, and cryptococcus. And here are some examples. So low bar pneumonia, that's pretty whited out in that in that lobe there. You can see it would be hard to miss that. Even I could see that. <laughs> Bronco pneumonia, again, see how it's still kind of in that same lobe, but it's much more patchy. Here you've got just the widespread, diffuse, fine little um, infiltrates. And the abscess, see that big round walled off area and down on the below or to the lower aspect you can kind of see an air fluid level. Can, can you go back and point to that with a stick? Cause that was this one? See that big round? <laughs> Uh, 
When you shoot the lateral x-rays, do you just need one side or do you generally do You generally get both. Oh, okay. Whenever you're looking for your pneumonia, you always get AP or yeah, PA and then PA and oh, okay. And then pulmonary nodules with more of your uh, lung tissue. Yeah. And then you can get a lot more with more of your uh, fungal infections. No, that's usually more when you're looking for something that's shifting. Um, do you want to make sure that it's Oh, if, well, the only time you're going to see that is if you have a fluid, air fluid level. And I think if you see a big circle with an air fluid level, whether it shifts or not, that's... Well, like, no, no, it's not going to, it shouldn't shift too much. Um, and then here, pulmonary nodules, you've got more, you know, they're a little bit bigger, a little bit um, lighter. More, um, bigger than see more. where it begins and where it ends. But what are they bigger than? What? You said they're bigger, but well, I was I thought they were bigger than the abscess, but that abscess on the previous slide looks well. I mean, bigger. versus like the smaller, oh, versus fine. Yeah, uh, here you've got a big nodule there, you got a nodule there, you got a nodule there, probably up there. Um, so they're bigger than those real small little infiltrates, but real diffuse. But, you know, a single pulmonary nodule can be a cancer, you know, so um, with that, you're going to probably do a bronchoscopy and try to get an actual biopsy um, from that so you can send that tissue off for culture, fungal culture, or, uh, and or have, them have a pathologist look at it to see if it looks like cancer. Multiple multiple um, nodules is probably leans more towards an infectious thing for the most part versus a cancer unless if it's a um, meta metastatic cancer okay so mortality um, big range pretty small for those who don't require hospitalization one to five percent um, increases up to 12 to 14 percent in those that have to go into the hospital uh, first time with diagnosis and then if you have to be hospitalized into the ICU that mortality risk goes up to 35 percent there are a couple of um, indexes that they have that kind of helps you guide who might need to be hospitalized and who might be okay with just treating outpatient. Okay, and we're going to talk about the first one is called the the PSI pneumonia severity index score, and then the curve 65. Again, you you have to always take your patient into account. If you've got, I don't know, um, somebody who scored pretty low, but you've got somebody who had, um, I don't know, has a mental capacity or an elderly person that has no help at home, not sure if they're going to be able to take their medications as required, things like that, then you might consider keeping them in hospital even though their, their scores are low. And neither one of these really tells you whether a person needs to be in ICU. Alright, so the, the PSI is also known as the research team Outcome, the patient outcomes research team score, report score, but I've heard of more of it of the PSI score. All right, so with this, they use look at 19 different clinical variables um, that they give points for. They calculate that all up, and then they put them in a risk stratification from one to five. Uh, one to three can be treated outpatient. Four and five should be admitted into the hospital. And again, you always have to use along with clinical judgment and, and that particular patient. So these are the different things they look at. I'm not going to test you, you know, what are the 19 things they look at. I don't care about that. I just wanted you to know that when you're in practice, there is something like this that you can tap into to, to better 
determine whether that person needs to be admitted or not. So you get so many points if, if they have these things, you calculate all those points up, if it scores 70 or below outpatient, um, if they have zero outpatient, if they have 71 to 90 points, outpatient but watch them closely or maybe hospitalize them for a day or two just to keep a little bit closer eye on them. If they're 91 or higher, they need to go in the hospital. And then the CURB 65 um, uses confusion, urea nitrogen, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. So confusion, um, you determined by asking, kind of doing a small mini, men, mini mental status exam. You ask them 10 questions that I, examples that I gave you examples of those 10 questions. Um, you give them a point for every one they got correct. Um, if they score eight or less, then they're considered confused. <laughs> Don't do that test on me. <laughs> I may not pass it. So if they are con considered confused, they get a point for the C. Urea, blood urea nitrogen, if it's greater than 19, they get a point. If their respiratory rate is greater or equal to 30, they get a point. If the blood, yeah. Um, since pneumonia is so common in the older population, what if confusion is their baseline? then they get a point. <laughs> yeah, because that's going to make it a greater Again, if they go home and they're completely confused, they're not going to be able to take their medicines as well. Respiratory rate, again, is greater than or equal to 30. They get a point. If their blood pressure, if, they're, if they have low blood pressure, if their systolic blood pressure is less than 90, or their di diastolic blood pressure is equal to or less than 60, or both of those, um, they get a point. And then they get a point if they are over 65 years of age. Again, three to five points should be admitted, possibly even the ICU. Two points, and should, you know, think about send, uh, keeping them in the hospital at least for a short period of time. One point, I think they are good to go. So with antibiotic treatment, we want it promptly, we want to get that on board promptly, and we try to pick an antibiotic that is most likely to be susceptible to kill the, the bacteria, take care of the bacteria that is most susceptible, uh, most likely to be the, the problem. If you're going to get blood and sputum cultures, do that before you start your antibiotics. But anything else, get your antibiotics on board. And don't wait around for the results of these. Just get them, get the, the specimens obtained and then get going on the antibiotic. Those, getting those results are not timely. So, um, but once you get them and it gives you some information to where your empiric therapy needs to be tweaked a little bit, that's when you can do that. So again, your, what antibiotic you pick, uh, or your empiric antibiotic you pick, is going to be based on, you know, are they just going to be paid, or outpatient, are they going into the inpatient, or ICU, other specific risk factors, if they've been exposed to, um, you know, various things been on antibiotics in the last 90 days for whatever reason that can put you at greater risk of pseudomonas actually so in fact they just asked my I was just thinking of that they asked my me for my dad has he been on antibiotics in the last 90 days and I was like oh you're asking for increased <laughs> risk of pseudomonas <laughs> okay um, I'm not going to go into much detail on the particular antibiotic Choices. Um, it's just a little bit different. Previous healthy, uh, not on antibiotics within the last three months. Macrolide, again, we were talking about the azithromycin. Uh, what Scott Interwitz was talking about, the increased 
resistance with that. Uh, so that's, I don't know if I'd use that as much. I might go with maybe a different uh, macrolide or doxycycline. If you have other comorbidities, um, you may want to bump that up uh, to like a fluoroquinolone. Uh, again, because you might get, we have a little bit more possibility for some of the uh, uh, drug resistant bugs. Inpatient, you're going to get a little bit, but not in the ICU. You're going to, again, get a little bit more aggressive uh, or maybe multi-medications to, to do some better coverage. Um, and for sure, if, you're, if they're going straight to the ICU. But again, I'm not going to get all into that. All right, follow-up. Again, for your healthy individual, previously healthy individual, that comes in, you suspect pneumonia, you treat them empirically, you expect that they're going to resolve just fine. So you don't really need to bring them back for a repeat x-ray. The repeat x-ray, though, can take those, the consolidation findings can take several weeks to even months for that to completely resolve. And that kind of goes along with why that lingering cough and, you know, can, can be delayed and, and just feeling a, a little bit under the weather. Your fever and the white blood cell count should go down after a few days of, of treatment. Now, if you have a patient that's been hospitalized for their pneumonia, I probably would recommend on follow-up to see him back in a, a month or two just so that I can repeat that chest x-ray and make sure that it's resolving. If it's not resolving, then you have to think about could there be a cancer in there or that just look like a pneumonia or cause the pneumonia. Vaccination prevention. And I may not go into this in great detail because I know Dr. Latassi is as well. We have two available vaccines in the United States, Prevnar 13 and Pneumovax 23. The Prevnar 13, they are using now in every kiddo, every newborn, um, dose at two months, four months, six months, and at some point between 12 and 15 months. Now, if you have an adult that you're going to recommend, I guess she'll get into this in more detail, but if a person, if an adult is at higher risk of developing pneumonia, they're going to get the get this um, they typically would like to give a dosage initially of the Prevnar 13 and then a year later follow up with the Prevnar 23 don't really know why that is um, if they get to be yeah if they get to be 65 and they've not had any kind of prophylaxis then do a Prevnar 13, and a year later do a Prevnar 35. If they even had a Prevnar, not 35, 23, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? God, I'm just, whatever, I'm making up <laughs> for A Pneumovax 23, if they even had a Pneumovax before age 65, you want to give them a booster after age 65. Kind of makes sense since I got my numbers mixed up a little bit. You also want to, you know, influenza can cause a, a viral pneumonia, so always want to vaccinate for influenza whenever possible. Again, anybody who's at risk for complications of influenza infection, 65 or older, people long term care facilities, healthcare providers, if they have other um, comorbid conditions, they need to get those annually. We have two forms of, of vaccination. We have the intramuscular injection, that is an inactivated, and then they have an intranasal live attenuated vaccine. 
one thing to remember is not everybody can use those live live vaccines. Um, I would deal with that a lot in dermatology for people who were on these immune, well, uh, biologic medications that can kind of suppress the immune system. You can't give somebody um, like that the live virus. I hope they took that off the market. I just Googled it and it said in February 2018 they just voted in favor of renewed recommendations yeah, for using it. They did take it and they brought it. They took it out and then they brought it. Because I know that too. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> up to date. Very up to date. Um, so remember that. If your immunocompromised patients or people on medications who can suppress their immune system can't take that live virus. All right, healthcare associated pneumonia. So we're going from the community acquired to the healthcare associated. So again, these are people not hospitalized in the hospital, but live in other long term care facilities, nursing homes. They undergo IV therapy, wound care, um, or if they've recently been hospitalized, like uh, within the last nine days. <clears throat> hemodialysis centers, places like that where you're at greater risk of getting exposed to, to uh, different bacteria. So this is identifying patients who are at higher risk of developing pneumonia due to some of these antibi antibiotic resistant pathogens. With the healthcare associated pneumonia, you have your same old bugs that cause the community acquired pneumonia plus a, few, a, a little bit of these uh, multi-drug resistant bugs such as gram-negative pseudomonas as we've talked about and MRSA, the methicillin resistant staph aureus. Most common, still strep pneumo but you always have to think about those other uh, drug resistant bugs that could play a role such as your uh, pseudomonas and, and strep. Or stats, um, so I mainly want you to know the, the strep pneumo, gram negatives, pseudomonas, and your staph aureus. You can get polymicrobial, obviously. And again, anytime you're dealing with these drugs that are these these pathogens that are harder to get rid of, your uh, mortality and morbidity always increases. All right, so this is kind of a brief thing, just kind of saying what we said. These these are some of the uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria and who they are in, who's at greater risk of, of having those particular pathogens as etiologies. Pseudomonas, antibiotic therapy in the preceding three months. That, that's a big one. Basically, healthcare associated pneumonia is going to be pretty much the same. The presentation is going to be pretty much the same. Sometimes, because they, they might be, especially like your nursing home patients, their, their mental cognition may not be quite as, as good, so they, they um, may show a little bit altered mental status, um, weakness, falling incontinence. Things like that. Decreased responsiveness, fever, but sometimes again in the elderly, especially you know nursing home, sometimes they don't spike fevers like normal people do. That that immune reaction just isn't quite there, so that can be a little tricky too. So the diagnosis is same as community acquired. Um, our physical exam. Um, sorry. They're, because they're a little bit more sick, they're going to be at risk of 
dehydration and hypoxemia. So even if I would always check a pulse ox on them, uh, they can they can be just a little bit tricky. Sometimes they just don't present quite as toxic as uh, someone else. So check that. Check your BUN and creatinine and see if they are dehydrated. The thing with that is that especially if they're dehydrated, the signs on x-ray uh, may not be there. So if you can rehydrate them, then sometimes you will see the, the x-ray findings much more prominently. Can you diagnose pneumonia? Are you, do you specifically have to say like this is community acquired versus like hospital acquired? Probably yes nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, I'm well, no, guessing like, the reimbursement is probably yeah. different, and you know if they're DRGs, you know if they have to be hospitalized, they're going to allow more time, you know, for treatment and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> the prognosis and treatment. Um, Okay, so hospital care associated, you're going to pretty much use your empiric treatment for your uh, community acquired, but you always need to think about some of the uh, multi-drug resistant uh, medications as well. If they're going to be shipped to a hospital, get them a dose of antibiotic on board before they go. some of the big things that, that distinguish nosocomial from just your community choir. Um, you've got a few little different bugs, more of the, the drug resistant pathogens. You've got, a, a, like I just said, higher um, risk of drug resistance and you've got your underlying poor health. So you've got a couple of things against you. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about this microaspiration. Um, what's interesting is when a person is hospitalized, they have found that within two days of being hospitalized, and I'm not talking about somebody healthy who's just in there to get their gallbladder removed. I'm talking about a much more ill, comorbid, other comorbid things going on that within a couple of days, they get a change in their baseline normal flora in their oral pharynx and stomach with the hospital bacteria, okay? So they become colonized with the bacteria that's in the hospital. And then when they aspirate or micro-aspirate, then that's how it can, can get down deeper into the lung. And you have other, you know, you're placing tubes. If you are intubated, it could be a contaminated <coughs> tube. If the nurse or whoever wasn't good at hand washing, they could, you know, shove bacteria along with the ET tube. Dirty hands, equipment, contaminated aerosols, you know, you cough and <laughs> whatever. Uh, you're dealing with patients that are just less healthy malnourished, advanced age, altered consciousness, where they're automatically more prone to, to uh, aspiration. And oftentimes their immune reaction is not as, as strong. Okay, let's talk now of the hospital nosocomial. Let's, let's concentrate on the ventilator acquired pneumonia. Again, the diet definition of this is that it develops more than 24 or 8 hours following intubation. <clears throat> and how your risk of coming down with pneumonia kind of depends upon how long you've been on the vent. The highest risk is right after it's placed. 
within the first five days or so, five to two days. Then, if you've been, then you have another big spike um, if you've been on for 30 days or longer. Your, your risk can go up to 70% to get pneumonia the longer you're on that, that ventilator. So people like to get people off ventilators as quickly as they can. Three factors are critical in the pathogenesis of this ventilator acquired. Again, you have a different colonization in the oropharynx with more pathogenic microorganism. You can aspirate these organisms into the lower respiratory tract. And again, you have a sicker person. That normal, normal host defense is not there. The ET tube, endotracheal tube itself, can cause some problems. Um, you know, they have to suction, they kind of push this thing out and suction all that secretion, which just disgusts me. I'm kind of one of those people, I can take vomit, I can take diarrhea, I can take gross skin stuff, but sputum and boogers, I just cannot do. Even babies, I'm like, get that finger out of your nose right now. <laughs> I just do not do well with that. Um, <laughs> my family make fun of me because on like funniest home videos or something, they always have a kid that like just blows out this nasty stuff, and they'll be like, "Oh, watch this!" <laughs> I'm like, uh, "No, I can't." <laughs> it's also found that um, this pathogenic bacteria actually forms some kind of a film around that tube surface, which make them harder to kill, um, harder to get the antibiotics to it, and as well as our own host defenses can't get to them as well. And the thing about the ET tube also is it can help prevent huge amounts of aspiration, large volume aspiration, but it actually increases the risk of these micro aspirations. So pretty much the same thing what we just said. It impairs the, the body's uh, host defense, the mucociliary clearance, trauma to that area, and you don't have as good of a cough reflex because you got that tube in your throat or in your trachea. I also found, too, that um, these severely ill patients, when they very first get into um, the ICU, they kind of go into this immunoparalysis where their immune system is just next to nothing. And this is actually kind of corresponds with if you are intubated during those first few days, that's when you're at even greater risk of, of getting pneumonia. or the longer you're on, on that. Okay, etiology, you've got your multi-drug resistant pathogens as well as the non-multi-drug resistant pathogens. Uh, the non-multi-drug group is nearly identical to that in the uh, community acquired. The multi-drug organisms vary a lot from hospital to hospital. But almost every hospital is going to have problems with Pseudomonas and MRSA. So just kind of keep that in mind. Every now and then you might get fungal or viral pathogens, especially in your <coughs> immunocompromised. And um, this next one says the very same thing I just said. The non-MDR pathogens. Okay, um, let's take a little break. Non-MDR, pretty much the same as the others. MDR pathogens are big two ones are the Pseudomonas and the MRSA. Sorry, go we'll take a break and we'll start back up.